now my pleasure to hand over to Victor Galaz, Deputy Director at the Stockholm Resilience Centre, who will be moderating the United Nations Development Programme's UNDP Hour today with a focus on the growing field of climate innovation. Thank over you to very you. much. Thanks, Thank you. Victor. Hi, everyone, and welcome to the UNDP Hour at the Stockholm Plus 50 Climate Hub, a stage and an online space available for you before, during and after the climate conference Stockholm Plus 50 until World Environmental Day on 5th of June. My name is Victor Galas. I'm the deputy director at the Stockholm Resilience Center, an interdisciplinary center that advances research on governance of socio-ecological systems based at Stockholm University. Now, during this hour, we will talk about climate innovation. And a little later, you will hear from young climate leaders who will give their insights into what is happening today in the Stockholm Plus 50 conference. But more about that later. Innovation. Innovation is often seen as key to achieve a stable climate system and a sustainable future for all. But what do we mean when we talk about innovation? Is it technological, economic, social, or all of the above? Who needs to innovate? And how do we make sure that innovation benefits all and not just those who can afford it? And lastly, don't we already know what to do? Maybe we need less innovation and more action. With me today, we have the following experts and impact entrepreneurs. Lisa Olive, who's the managing director of Nordic countries at Norgen. Peter Fikowski, physicist and engineer, serial entrepreneur and author. And Kumar Kasimastade, who's the founder of Flexpenser, and Cecilia Repinski, founder of Green Asset Wallet. So welcome. Welcome to you all. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. How are you? I'm just going to get my notes. <laughs> <laughs> So here we go. I'm, I'm going to start with you, Lisa. Sure. Uh, about innovation. So Norgren House. Yes. It's a so-called impact hub, and you create infrastructure for small and medium-sized businesses to have a climate impact. Why does the world need impact hubs like Norgren? So first of all, we don't only focus on climate impact. We focus on any impact because mm -hmm. the world has a lot of problems. But as you say, climate is the one that's closest to people's minds. Uh, and we have a, a big portion of teams in the house focusing on climate. I, why we exist from the start is just very simple. Mm -hmm. I, I think a lot of people agree with me that the acceleration isn't going fast enough. Innovation is key and innovation is often related to tech. So the impact entrepreneurs that reside in our house, what's different about them or what they, what they all have in common is that in one way or another, they're trying to so solve a world problem. Mm -hmm. They see it as a brilliant business opportunity. And we actually see that those who scale very fast, they also scale very successful businesses. Mm. Um, and they do it uh, almost always using tech because you need, seem to need tech in order mm. to scale innovations quickly. Mm. And if we didn't have a hub, because starting a business is hard, being a small entrepreneur, on average, we have about 550 people in Stockholm right now. We have two houses, three soon, but in Stockholm, it's about 550 people. Mm. They comprise 160 companies. That means on average, people are two to three people per team. Mm. That's small businesses. Mm. It's, it's tricky to be an entrepreneur in a small mm. one. Mm. Um, so you need the infrastructure. You need access to the capital. You need access to working space. You need access to um, a network that can help you grow and help you with expertise that um, you may not possess within your team mm. that is uh, expensive to, to purchase mm. from other places. But what I'm thinking is also that, uh, I mean, so you, the tech sector, right? So, yes. so what is the role of government? I mean, is, is the tech sector and private sector going to solve this by itself? How, how do you look at that? I think that's the million dollar question. <laughs> um, I couldn't possibly address things that big of a question, but I, I, I don't know. I, I know that we have cutting edge impact ideas. Mm -hmm. um, these ideas, these entrepreneurs, they get capital, they get attention and they do scale their businesses. Mm. There has to be a sort of a faith in the idea itself, because mm. everybody seems to agree that we need new solutions. Mm. Um, and where politics comes in, I don't know. But yeah. politics has a, has a strong will to change as well. So mm. at, at some point in step, um, I would say they do. Mm. But another thing, I mean, so Stockholm Plus 50 and sustainability is a global, global mm. issue, right? But we also have Global North and the Global South. So what I'm thinking, I mean, Norgen, you have your headquarters here in Sweden. Do you see a risk that the type of innovation that you work with 
sort of is based and, and fulfills the need of people of the global south. How, how do you get that other perspective into your work? Um, yes, of course. I mean, uh, solutions and networks can only expand so far. That's why we have a house in Rwanda, in Kigali as well, mm. that we opened last year, where we try to do the same things that we do in Stockholm. And Stockholm is trying to cover the Nordics. Um, where we now in Rwanda is trying to, in the same way, um, support um, entrepreneurs mm. uh, for Eastern Africa. Mm. Oh, that's great. I have a quest similar question to you, Peter. Yes. Kukowski. You're an astrophysicist. You've been called a serial entrepreneur. You also published a new book. Yes. Uh, and you spent considerable time in Silicon Valley. It's always Silicon Valley. Whenever we talk about climate innovation, we talk about Silicon Valley. Why do we need climate innovation from your point of view? Well, you, you really brought it up in your introduction to the hour, mm. which is we want a, a climate that everyone can survive long term. Mm. And so the big innovation that, that came to my attention was that our, our current goals of uh, trying to stay below two degrees or one and a half, if you think about it, no one has ever claimed that humans can survive that. Or just, we might, or maybe you know, Bill Gates' children might, but not everybody. And so the goal really that we want, that I wanted when I was a, a in college is to get CO2 to levels that humans have survived long term. Mm. And to do that while our structures are in place, our in industry and ecosystems. And so the innovation here is actually innovating a definition of the problem. Mm. So the although we are all going to uh, reduce emissions and do the energy transition, um, that's just a small part of it. The big part is getting the trillion tons of CO2 back out mm -hmm. so that we actually have the same climate we had while we developed agriculture and civilization. Mm. And what's amazing, what's amazing about innovation is that once you specify the problem, the solutions become visible. And mm. it turns out that we have the technology we need, we have the finance we need to actually get CO2 back to below 300 by 2050. Mm. And what's needed now is the leadership which again, which is why the UN is here, why your Stockholm Resilience Center is here to provide that leadership. Mm. And, and I hope that listeners and especially the youth take on calling for the goal of restoring the climate, not just part way reducing emissions, mm. but reducing emissions plus the big thing of getting all the way back. Mm -hmm. But I, again, going back to the question about Silicon Valley. Yes. And, and the global north, global south. Does the world need another... Innov uh, innovator from Silicon Valley to propose solutions to the climate problem. H how do you reflect on that? I think, you know, it, I, I feel a little, uh, oh, I can't think of the word, uh, bold, but mm. in a sense, yes. That is, there's a certain mm. freedom we have in Silicon Valley to think way outside the box. Mm. And so um, I got into this by um, having my software business in computer chip manufacturing and then doing volunteer work on poverty reduction. Mm. And over the decades in the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s, uh, th poverty reduction just went beautifully. You know, the Millennium Development Goals had failures, but they were a wild success. Mm. And by 2010, things were plateauing, and in, especially mm. in climate-stricken areas, like Syria, for example. And as a Silicon Valley person, I looked at, like, what are people overlooking? And there's a certain arrogance <laughs> that we have in Silicon Valley where we can ask, where we just normally ask questions that people mm. don't like asking sometimes. Because uh, even when I was at MIT, I would think, oh, those people in Silicon Valley, th they know what the, how to solve this. But when you're in Silicon Valley, you, you're not withheld thinking someone else is going to solve it. It's like, you know what? If it's not solved yet, mm. it's our job to mm. think outside the box. Mm. And you've been a little bit critical to, to the climate sciences, I understand. I mean, and I've done a little bit of sustainability science and, and climate you've work. You've done a lot. So, uh, <laughs> and you've been accused, I mean, you've said that climate scientists do not know who their customer is. I'm curious to hear what you mean by that. Yeah, it, it, it was an interesting revelation. I'm a physicist, so I understand, you know, I, I'm speaking, for, uh, attacking myself as well. And for me, the, the breakthrough in climate was at a, at a lunch dinner at one of the COP meetings, one of the climate meetings in Marrakech. And it was a bishop who organized the dinner, and he was lecturing us about how 
climate is a moral issue. And my physicist brain said, oh, yeah, moral, whatever. And after the second glass of wine, <laughs> I realized that the science of climate is really interesting. Mm. And it will be very interesting no matter what happens, whether humans go extinct or whether we stay alive, it'll be interesting. Now, as a human, it's a whole different matter. As a human, I want my, my race, my, my species, to stay alive. And that's a moral issue, not a science issue. Mm. And, and I thought, well, why is it my friends at MIT and Harvard and Stanford and Berkeley and, and even at the Resilience Center, why are they focusing on just the technological aspects of climate? Um, you know, there's billions of dollars being sent on, spent on how to get mm. CO2 out of the air in a way that's good for industry in a way that's good for the economy. And I realized, well, because it's those businesses that pay the universities, that pay the taxes that the government gives to the university. Mm -hmm. And for someone your age, for example, I, I'm a grandfather now, so I'm less worried about my, my children have gone through college. They're advanced. Um, but when I was, was your age, I was worried about my career. And I had to do things that people would pay me for, which is industry. And so there's a certain value in us grandfathers and grandmothers and the youth. You know, mm. I love mm. the uh, Fridays for Future because mm. they have nothing to lose. Mm. Mm. And I'm really calling on the grandmothers and grandfathers and the Fridays for Future to call for restoring mm. the climate mm. because like, the, the, in the system yeah. brings forth mm. just industry, mm. which is good, yeah. but not everything. We'll actually hear from the youth movement a little later yes. but then you brought, brought up the issue of, of finance which is one of my favorite topics of yes. course and we have Cecilia Repinski here this is one of your expertises as well so we, there are several reports and, and uh, some of them show that climate tech has grown five times faster than investments in other sectors which is of course is promising so any reflections on that trend and then where are we now 2022 in this very turbulent time in terms of climate tech investments mm -hmm. Well, these investments have to go further, of course, otherwise we would be extinct, and that is a moral <laughs> issue, as we just confirmed, <laughs> right? Um, but with the green assets wallet, and the way we see this is that money is energy in the socio-economic ecosystem. So if you direct capital towards unsustainable over-exploitation and fossil fuels, etc., that is what we will grow and it would tip us over the edge. But if we redirect it towards sustainable and positive value creation in the real economy, that's what will grow. So it's, it's really a prerequisite that we bring capital along this journey of the transition because otherwise it's not going to work. Um, and that's why I founded the Green Assets Wallet. Our mission is to scale and redirect capital, global capital, towards a better earth and make sure that it's scaled, it's redirected, but also that it leads to a credible transition. Because if it doesn't lead to a credible transition, it's not going to, uh, to help out. Mm. I mean, there have been many promises from the sector in the last years, I would say, so your assessment would be that those promises from the sector to contribute to sustainability, has, have those been fulfilled from your point of view or are we even getting close? Um, I think that in the last, I've been working with sustainable finance for 20 years mm. and I think in the past seven years or so, something really shifted in the finance sector mm. and all of a sudden financial institutions really stepped up and they wanted to deliver on actual impact in the real economy. And this was new, and this also led to a big surge in the green debt market, because all of a sudden you had this instrument that's really uniquely placed to deliver in the real economy. Otherwise, it's really difficult for financial institutions to ensure that their investments are leading to positive change on the ground. But with bonds, and sustainable and labeled bonds, you have those those opportunities because it is earmarked to actual activities. That said, the potential doesn't just automatically translate into being materialized unless you make sure that it does deliver on, mm. on a credible impact. And I think that in the first wave of the label debt market, there was a lot of sort of thankfulness that there is an instrument that can actually do this job. Mm. And the second wave from financial institutions was but wait a second, 
what is this leading to? I have no idea what impact I'm generating. And you want to understand this because you basically uh, invest in a, an expensive investment. You provide issuers of green debt with a small premium, so-called greenium. So you, in a way, exchanging a bit of your yield for impact. So what is that impact? What mm. did you actually deliver in the real economy? Mm. And I find that the conversation has really shifted. And now our conversation with investors is very much around the credibility of that transition and the credibility of this data, which I find very promising. I don't only think that we should say, okay, so, so uh, private capital needs to step up, they have a moral responsibility. At the end of the day, governments have a responsibility mm. to have mm. the, the playing rules for those institutions. And in the financial ecosystem, you have lots of asset managers and then you have asset owners. Most asset owners are pension funds. What are those money? It's our money. Mm, mm. It's our responsibility. Mm. Have we delivered on our promises? Mm. So we can all influence the way capital is redirected. Mm. Mm. I think that's a good point. We're going to get back to a, a related issue to that about phasing out. Okay. So not only contributing to green investments, but actually phasing out yeah. bad ones. But I, I want to turn to you, Kumars. Yeah. I know I mispronounce uh, your second That's name okay. before. It's I'm so positive. sorry about that. I hate it when people do that to me and how I did it to you. <laughs> you so, so I really apologize. But uh, there's something about innovation and also about upscaling. You, you want things to scale. I mean, that's a very common, common topic whenever you talk about innovation. Um, so tell us a little bit about your company, first of all, uh, and what are the obstacles that you see to scale up innovation? Yeah. So... I just want to say that based on the UN data from 2017, every day we waste 2 million tons of liquids mm. and that directly pollutes our ecosystem surface waters or underground waters because it's hard to discard the liquids unlike other waste. So um, Flexpenser will end the liquid waste in, and also semi-liquid waste. Think of the sunscreens, the medicines, milk, in different industries. So the problem is when we open a liquid package, mm -hmm. air and contaminants get in. And then it's only a matter of time. It doesn't matter if you close the uh, package, it mm -hmm. will, and, or you put it in the fridge or in a cupboard, it will spoil fast. Mm -hmm. So that's, the, uh, uh, that's where when we enter, we have a solution that prevents this spoilage. Mm -hmm. And it also eliminates the use of preservatives. And um, it came from the university. Mm. Uh, it's based on science and technology as well. Mm. So to, to your second question, uh, I think the biggest obstacle uh, for us now mm. is to financing because we have all the knowledge. Mm. We mm. have the network and the support here mm. and international. We have verified our solution with many uh, leading companies uh, internationally, but financing allows us to... Mm. expand and scale. So is that the main challenge, financing? Uh, it's the main challenge currently, yeah. 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 Okay. So I'm going to throw in a difficult question. And I'm, anyone who wants to jump on board, maybe, maybe especially for you, Lisa, by the way. There's something about te technology <laughs> and innovation. There's something called Jeevan's mm. paradox you probably know about. So, so there is a tendency of innovation to offer efficiency gains, but those efficiency gains get consumed up by more consumption. I mean, you see that for electricity, sure. you see that for, for cars, etc. How do we break that paradox? I mean, promote innovation without continuing to expand mm -hmm. on material use and energy use. And the honest question is, I don't know. Mm. But, but take an, a product like Humor's um, invention. It, it really works. Everybody can relate to sunscreen. It says on the back, you know, it's valid for two years, but if you open it, you can only use it for six months. Mm -hmm. There's this little symbol. That actually addresses that problem. Mm. Um, should, would I be buying more sunscreens? Probably not, because the one I have at home works. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe then it's down to the essence of the product itself. Mm. You will always run the risk of overconsumption. Um, airplane flights, etc. if you make it more accessible. But at the same time, it's, there, there is an inherent... Um, the smartness in mm. the right type of products and innovations. Mm. Um, I choose to be positive because mm. sort of we, we know we have to do this. Mm. Um, so I, I would like to you know, go on a broad scale and like something's mm. got to give mm. and, and it is going to be a bit of a Darwinistic approach. Mm. The, right, the right innovations are mm. going to mm. excel. 
What, what do you think? Yeah. I'll let you in yeah. soon. But, but Peter, I know. I mean, you, you, you talk about removal of carbon dioxide yes. from mm. the atmosphere. How do, how do we know that those innovations are not just going to allow us to postpone the problem? That is a great question. The key, again, this is part of being from Silicon Valley, is being very clear about who the customer is, mm. which in this case is humanity, and then what they want, which is a, a sustainable planet to live on and, um, and a sustainable society. And so if you define the, the problem very carefully, the solutions will naturally include all the variables. So the main way to get carbon out of the atmosphere not, not surprisingly, is the same way that nature does it. We have ice ages every 100,000 years. In the last, 10, last million years, nature has removed that same amount mm. of CO2 that we need to remove 10 times. And we can do the same thing that nature did. And we know that nature has developed the, uh, the resilience mm. to be able to deal with the, the ecological changes that happen when the CO2 level goes up and down. And so we can monitor that, keeping an eye on what human beings need. Mm. And so, but the, the trick is, as, as people, at, w when we start out, we start out looking through a very narrow telescope, through a mm. very narrow lens. Mm. And then it takes time to be able to expand that to what all of humanity needs. And that just takes a lot of expertise. Mm. But you gotta, you gotta keep that expertise in. And my new book, uh, Climate Restoration, the only future that will sustain the human race, works to introduce that idea. You know, especially I hope your uh, resilience center takes it on. That the for the sustainability of the whole human race i think that's key for all of us especially nature nature-based solutions and, and the role of the biosphere yeah. cecilia you had something on, related to that no okay. i really think you hit the mark on the nail yeah. uh, really uh, and i think this is a problem and it really boils down to our lifestyles mm. um, and i can't help thinking we're in such a tough position globally in terms of inflation rates and in terms of you know geopolitical issues etc cetera, etc cetera. it's a really tough period for mm. a lot of people and a lot of households and families etc but i also wonder if this will somehow change the way we consume um, and make us more mind mindful um, so at least something good can come out of this crisis that we're in. Mm. Go ahead, Lisa. I just want to comment on that. And, and I mm. agree, and I think it's sort of, it's going to be a fine balance there. Because uh, it was in the Swedish newspaper this morning that uh, flights uh, heading south this summer are already sold out because everybody wants a nice summer holiday. We are not going to get people to simply stop uh, flying south for w w warmer temperatures um, if we know the, the individual benefit. Now, the collective benefit, as we all agree, is, is, is not as good because it, it stands to the climate. And then it's back to the innovations again. So mm. absolutely, like Cecilia is saying, I, I do think we will change our patterns. But mm. as we change, we also need these solutions so that it's not going to work to simply ask people to not be flying or not be over-consuming or not buy, buy new products. We have to sort of get those two to go together yeah. because mm. then, yeah, I do yeah. think we can actually... It's yeah. not an either or. or. We need exactly. all we the need, solutions we that both. we can get yeah. and also change in behavior. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah, and because what we want to do is ensure the survival of our species, of humanity. And that would be nice. <laughs> yeah, and that's our job. Yeah. You know, and we, we have to remember that. And when you do that, then people will naturally do the right thing regarding flying south. Because there's a lot of benefit to flying south. You see new people, you get new ideas. It's not a simple you know, 20 gallons of jet fuel. Mm. It's the, a whole balance. And uh, as a social being, we, t we integrate that as long as we all align on the, fl the flourishing of humanity. Mm. That's great. So we're going to take a very small break, just to look at a, a little video to remind us ourselves why, why we're here and why we're doing this. We are both creature and molder of our environment. The crisis of human environment is a global crisis. Our capability to transform our surroundings, if used wisely, can bring to all peoples the benefits of development and enhance quality of life. But through ignorance or indifference, we can do massive and irreversible harm to the environment on which our life and well-being depend. We see around us growing evidence of harm. 
dangerous levels of pollution in water, air, earth, and living beings, major disturbances to ecological balance, distraction, and depletion of irreplaceable resources. Millions continue to live below the minimum levels required for a decent human existence. A point has been reached in history when we must shape our actions with more care for their environmental consequences. <laughs> to defend and improve the human environment has become an imperative for us all, a goal to be pursued in harmony with the fundamental goals of peace, economic, and social development. To achieve this will demand responsibility by citizens and communities, enterprises and institutions at every level in common effort. It is so decided. Remember, it is people that propel social progress, develop science and technology, and through their hard work, continuously transform the human environment. We are both creature and molder of our environment. Okay. Okay, welcome back. So one challenging aspect of innovation, uh, I believe, and this is something that my colleague Pedelson taught me, he's a transformation uh, expert. He told me that there's so much interest around new innovation and creating new things. But actually, one of the key aspects of moving into a different direction is actually to let some things go and phase out. Uh, so I want to uh, discuss that a little bit with you uh, in terms of what are the things that you see from your sectors that actually need to be phased out and even more actively. Can we start with you? Uh, in, uh, in, in, like, you mean in entrepreneurship yes. or? Or in your sector or where you're working now? Uh, because, uh, so we are now focusing on uh, liquid packaging. Mm. And I think I'm gonna disagree. I think we need a new thing here. Mm -hmm. Because uh, it has been, uh, the industry has been like this since like a, many, many decades, near the century. And you know, all the packages, they look like each other mm -hmm. with the small changes. And that it doesn't help the, uh, our climate. So I, I'm, I'm saying that we need, to, we need a paradigm shift in our industry. And mm. that's what uh, we offer here now. Mm. So that paradigm shift means, means leaving some old means, things behind. Uh, means don't get used to uh, the way that we consume liquids mm -hmm. or the product. Mm. Be open to a new solution for mm. that. Mm. That's that good. that helps our climate. That mm. yeah. Mm. So to you, Cecilia, going to you, I think I think yeah. fossil fuel investments, fossil fuel subsidies, deforestation risk yes. commodities. That is the obvious. That is the obvious uh, answer for me. Mm. But I'm going to talk in terms of my what we do at the Green as a Solid, mm. which is about bringing credible data to the market. And mm -hmm. I think what we need to phase out is unreliable sustainability data because it just fools us. And if we're going to redirect capital towards a sustainable transition, we need quantifiable, verifiable, measurable impact data. What's going on in the real economy? Because we have a sustainability challenge. We know we need to redirect massive amounts of global capital. And when we talk about sustain the sustainability transition and, and sustainable finance, there's so many qualitative, descriptive scores, et cetera, et cetera, going on in this place. And I think what the market really needs is that trusted, credible data. We need to face out all other data um, in order to really hold uh, 
investors accountable mm. for their investments and for their decisions. And I think that investors are really there. They're driving this now. Mm. Um, and they want to know, is this credible? Is this really happening? I mean, the conversations we're having with investors today are really sophisticated around impact data. Uh, and they really want to know, is this real? No, this was actually based on a calculation. Then I'm actually going to mm. give that lower... Um, value in my decisions, etc., which I think is really promising development. But still, a lot of capital is directed to something we may think is sustainable, uh, when in fact it may not lead to an actual transition. So we need to phase out bad data, mm. because it just fools at all, us all. That's a good point. That said, I just want to yeah. say something. Yeah. We're not perfect at the green as the solid. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we strive <laughs> towards bringing data that is good enough, mm. um, but we're not perfect. I just yeah. want to say that. Yeah. No, I, I, it's challenging. Data is always yeah. challenging. Listen, what's your take on this? And for, for a climate tech for like a hub, innovation hub. Yeah. What's the role of face out? What, what so do you need to face out? I was inspired. I need, I need yeah. to like change my answer uh, and <laughs> actually build on to what Cecilia was saying. So if we can put monetary value on any consumer products, mm. we can actually understand. And, and what I'm referring to is a framework that I know Harvard Business School is working on. It's just not finished. Um, so examples I've seen cannot be named, but you have fussy soft drinks of a darker color and they, cost, they sort of cost the same, they look the same. For me as a consumer, I pay almost the same amount for both of those drinks. But in reality, the cost for the planet one has, has twice the size of, of a footprint than the other one. So I actually like this answer quite a lot. Can we, put, can, can we get reliable data and can, can we even take a step further? Can we, can we monetize the footprint on products? We can agree. Mm. So the f it's almost like the face that that question as well is just so big. We, we can all agree, agree that we're never going to, uh, that we're always going to disagree on the priorities. Mm. But if we actually understand the monetary value of it, or it can be another way to measure it. But can we just find a way to agree? We can probably agree what to face out. Mm. Because I can, I can come up with 15 examples mm. within every industry we should be facing out. Mm. Data is powerful. What yeah. you, what you measure gets managed. I agree. Um, mm. So maybe we need to complement innovation hubs with dismantler hubs or similar. Mm. So like uh, we simply need to continue the road towards mm. data-driven understanding mm. of what is impact. Mm. Impact yeah. is not just doing mm. good because it feels good. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Peter, what's your take on that? Well, I Facing out. I love the question. I hadn't mm. thought of it that way. And uh, you know, in, in my field, you don't get rid of something, you replace it. Mm -hmm. And the thing that I would replace is the, the two degree warming goal, mm -hmm. which was designed to maximize uh, GDP growth with no measurement of hu human health or even human survivability was done by Nobel economists, the two degree warming. And the one and a half degree is a little bit like that. The, the, what we want to do is supplant that with a zero degrees warming, so an RCP zero, which I hope your institute will, in, will work with me to mm -hmm. develop. So get a zero degree goal because we know that's the, the climate that humans are designed for and that's what we want. Mm -hmm. Uh, there was a good reason in 1977 for two degrees, but it's not 1977 anymore. This is 2022. That's a radical proposition. It's a I radical. might disagree with some of the details too, but I think it, it's, it's an interesting uh, to discuss uh, also. Another thing that I've been thinking about, and of course as, as innovators, uh, turbulence and the role of turbulence and yeah. the fact that we have, I mean, from 2020 onwards, it's been an extremely yep. turbulent uh, face in, in the development of the world through the pandemic and the war in Ukraine. So as a reflection, I mean, from your point of view, what is the role of turbulence and innovation? Does it trigger more innovation or might it actually stifle innovation in dangerous ways? How, what's your experience? So I, I can relate to Norwegian mm -hmm. Stockholm. Um, the past two years, the, the years that we refer to as Corona, was in many ways quite constructive for a lot of the entrepreneurs um, that were uh, in the face of scaling their businesses in, into um, an, an actual market product. Um, why? Because they are trying to solve a problem. I'm, I'm not saying at all that, that there were beautiful times and everyone were happy, but we saw quite constructive forces coming in because capital 
like Kumar was saying, capital seems to be the one priority everybody needs in order to be able to scale. Capital was much more carefully selected, and then it was sort of geared towards the solutions that that one could truly understand and believed mm. in. Um, so I, I'm not saying that it's all together good, not at all. It's it's quite actually quite tough, and it's mm. tough for a lot of people. Mm. But I also see that there are positive forces in disruption. Mm. What would you say, any, Cecilia, what's your experience, I mean, in terms of green investments and the recent turbulence? Yeah, I think it? that in terms of the geopolitical situation we're in, we see a sort of a bridging phase where investments in, um, in fossil might increase for a while. But I think that this is a bridging phase. Mm. And in that perspective, it's quite interesting also what's happening in the responsible investment community and the mandate for what you consider to be sustainable and impactful has changed. Mm -hmm. um, and tough Fuck, questions yeah. are being put on the table, such yeah. as someone will finance the weapons industry. Mm. Who do we want to be on the owner's list mm. of those industries? Is it responsible to back out or is it actually a prerequisite that we have solid dem democratic governments mm. who are owning these companies? So some of those issues that were sort of in the not invited into the nicer halls mm -hmm. <laughs> of sustainable finance have now um, been invited. Mm. So we see lots of interesting developments. But in terms of climate change, I think that we have a bridging period mm. Mm. that everyone knows we have to shift to sustainable yeah. in the long term. Yeah. And it's moving. Yeah. Any reflection on that? Yeah, Peter. Yeah, the, 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 yeah turbulence is a problem everywhere, if, if flying an airplane, sailing a boat. Um, I used to do a fair bit of sailing and the wind would shift and the, the tides would shift, the, the current would shift. And the important thing was to keep an eye on where we wanted to go. And one of the wonderful things, as you said, about turbulence is you discover new things and it opens up new ways of thinking. And you have to keep an eye on where the ultimate place you want to go, which is humanity flourishing. Mm. Kimmers, has yeah. Has this recent time inspired it in your thinking? <laughs> of course, I mean, yeah. the whole medical industry has flourished mm -hmm. because of that. But uh, I think I agree with uh, the whole people here. Um, one other aspect is that it actually, mm, if you're weak in the business, mm -hmm. you're going to be, you're not going to be successful mm -hmm. because of, uh, if you're a bad boss, for example, mm -hmm. Uh, your business will go down. And that was a time that, like, um, to ident identify, it's good for the consumers and the customers to see which companies can uh, s survive this period. Mm. And usually they are better, uh, they have to have a better uh, team environment in the company. So that aspect, I think, also has another aspect in the humanitarian thing. Mm. Mm. I mean, one of the challenges, I guess, and maybe you can talk about that, Cecilia, is, is when we've seen the investments during the pandemic, a lot of it went to older models. I think uh, Joe Stieglitz, uh, Nobel laureate in, in economics, mentioned a few days ago is that actually when the capital was allocated, it was only the old industry that was around mm -hmm. the table, not the industry of the future. And mm -hmm. that's why you saw that pattern. Mm. Is there anything, is something that you might recognize in terms of how investments moved during the pandemic? Um, I don't know. I mean, mm. I think that anything that goes to down sustainable has to shift. And we see in tech that it's really expensive to build wrong. <laughs> That's yeah. why we have like mm. product owners and all of those processes, because it's expensive to back. And I mm. think it's the same way here. I mean, what, if you invest in infrastructure that sits for 30 years, it's going to be really expensive to back. Yeah. And it's not going to be something we can keep in the long term. So it's expensive to invest wrong at this stage. Mm. We don't have that enough time for mm. those longer term infrastructures mm. To, mm. to last. Mm. It has to be sustainable now. Yeah, good point. I mean, things that we've discussed, right? So science, the tech sector, the private sector, governments. I thought it, it might be interesting to hear reflections of, on the UN system, the United Nations system. Now, what is the role of an organization such as UNDP and, and other UN bodies mm -hmm. to drive mm -hmm. innovation. 
Have you thought about that? What, what would be your take on that? Well, well I'm fairly new. It's, I've been involved in climate probably the least of anyone here, just about eight or, eight or ten years. And what I've discovered is wonderful about the United Nations system is it's a place to meet exactly like this. Mm. And a lot of my friends are disappointed that the UN does not take action but we take action when we go home, and I'm very energized from this discussion, and I'm hope, hopefully I will convince you to pursue RCP0 at your institution out of this, because we want, that's the outcome we all want. Um, the UN's goal, uh, uh, mission, or what UN accomplishes is these meetings of the mind and meetings of the soul. And mm. it's wonderful for me. <laughs> what about you? What's your take on, on the UN system? I, I think I see it very simple. Um, mm. th there is no supranational ambition other than the UN in place to date. It's, it's, it's always going to be important. Mm. Um, we have the European Union, we have other unions, we have the African unions, but th there's no one, no other body that is trying to to put everybody around the same table. Um, there will always be um, strengths and weaknesses in, in that ambition, but um, the climate, I mean, we can address it locally, but the solution is going to have to be global. Mm. So we need the, the global body with us. Mm. Cecilia, do you mind? Take yeah. on that, the UN system. I mean, I think every actor has a role to play, and mm. I think the UN has a, a really powerful convening power uh, that can be harnessed for this. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I that? just uh, the same. Everyone says everything. I think is the best coordinator. Mm. Like mm. the goals that have been set mm. has uh, started a movement that we can see. Companies are taking. Mm into action but in their decision making see mm. the points that are mm. pointed out by UN so mm. uh, yeah I think I mean one of the key things that are being discussed now at Stockholm Plus 50 that's happening now uh, within the UN uh, conversations is, is social inequalities and global inequalities we have two more minutes if anyone wants to explore that I mean what is the connection between climate innovation and addressing social inequality yeah. Well, you know, in, in writing my book, The Climate Restoration, I looked at what's the base cause of, climate, of the climate, global warming, and it's really the fact that the human population is 10 times the very stable level we had during that stable last 10,000 years. And um, in order to provide for the, the poor, we need to have move ourselves back to a, a stable popula a sustainable population, which turns out, again, since once you define it, becomes very, very achievable with all the structures we have in place. You just need leadership to say we want a sustainable population. Mm. And so it's, it's, for me, it's very exciting to discover that when you define numerically the outcome, the solutions to cost almost nothing, and they just require leadership and the meeting that UN provides. And mm. thank you for your huge contribution to it. <laughs> and all of you. So, any final reflections on, on equality? Uh, no more than that, that it's fairly obvious that, mm. that huge disruptions like war, like um, the, the climate problems that we see, they, they accelerate uh, social inequalities. Mm. So, I, I don't know how we would address them s straight on, but mm. we, we need to solve a lot of problems mm. because problems, the, the big, the macro problems, accelerate social inequalities. Mm. Mm. Cecilia, any take on that? I mean, in sustainable finance and impact mm. investment, the social issue is the really trickle part to yeah. solve with data. Mm. Uh, so we struggle there. I mean, our theory of change is to unlock the matching effect between investment and those project developers that deliver impact. And we mm. do that through data. Mm. So our theory of change is basically that really credible and impactful actors you find capital easily and be able to negotiate really good terms. So they will actually be the winners who can grow. But how do we make sure that it doesn't have trade-offs with social mm. issues, et cetera, mm. and how can we bring that data into the equation? Mm. And, and everyone is talking about the S in mm. ESG and yeah. how to find yeah. the right data sets to, mm. to um, make informed decisions. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, very challenging mm. question indeed. We need to time. wrap up. I, Thank you so much. Such a wise panel. Thank you so much for your contributions. <laughs> you. We need to move over to the next uh, segment. So climate change impacts everyone, but the future belongs to young people. 
As the grip of climate change tightens, young people are leading efforts to change the future by demanding climate action from the governments. The demands from young people get louder and youth-led action on climate change is growing strong across the globe. Whether through education, activism, innovation, science or technology, young people are scaling up their efforts and using their skill to accelerate climate action. So UNDP have asked Clara Hendrik, Nordic TV personality and actress, if she could interview young leaders on what is happening today in Stockholm Plus 50, and she's responded by bringing them into this stage. So over to you, Clara. Thanks a lot, Victor. Of course I can. And here I am with two young leaders and entrepreneurs standing <coughs> right here next to me. Hi, welcome. Oh, thank you. Hi. We have uh, Maximo Matsoko who is the founder and managing director of EcoHouse Global, an action for sustainability youth-led nonprofit organization, and Joshua Amponsem, who is the founder of Green Africa Youth Organization, working with the Office of the UN Secretary General's Envoy on Youth. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Hi. <laughs> I am very glad to have you here uh, to talk about the conference and give uh, us and the viewers the latest from within it. But let's turn to you first and get to know the both of you. Uh, Joshua, where did you arrive from into Stockholm? I came from Davos. I was at the World Economic Forum. Uh, so I arrived from Switzerland, uh, but I'm originally from Ghana. From Ghana. Yes. And what is the most urgent uh, climate issue in your country and region right now? If I look at sub-Saharan Africa right now, water and food is a very big problem. When we don't have water, it's a crisis. You have drought. When the water comes, it's a crisis because it comes more than we can actually accommodate. So then we have flooding and that becomes a problem as well. And both drought and flooding is not good for agriculture. So that translates into food insecurity and that is the biggest challenge we have on the continent right now. Drought, floods, food insecurity. Mm. It's very nice to have you here. Thank you. And Maximo, you work with such a large net of uh, volunteers in South America and globally also. Please tell us a bit about that. Okay, uh, we are part of um a youth movement that is called Eco House Global. We work in Latin America and now we, we are starting some venues in Africa as well. And we are we have more than 40 projects running trying to demonstrate that youth can also do it. So that's the, the main idea, to interact, to get involved and to act, mm -hmm. not only uh, say. The, the main idea is to act, to do actual things towards sustainability. Mm. Isn't it hard to handle like all these volunteers? Is it a big uh, like <laughs> project leading uh, job? We would love to to have more resources, but with this crisis being eight billion people, we need to do what we can from where we can. So our our idea is the the same as always: think global, act local. We divide uh, ourselves and try to advocate in 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 our homes. Mm -hmm. And with this uh, process and with this kind of, of thinking, we really achieve amazing things. And that's what inspires us to do more and more and more. Mm -hmm. Welcome here, you two. Um, it's the last day of the two days of the conference, Stockholm Plus 50. What's the atmosphere like inside the conference today? Or yesterday, if you were there yesterday? Um, I was there both yesterday and today. Yeah. Um, the atmosphere is, well, you can describe it in many ways. One part of it is that you have a lot of agency within people but the atmosphere itself at the place, you don't feel that urgency. So that is something that is very, sort of you, you sort of question it, right? Where is this going and what is really going to happen? At the same time, um, like I said, you get agency within people and that they want to do something. So when you get bilateral meetings or when you sit down to talk to any of the stakeholders, you can really tell that, you know, there is a common agreement that we are late and we need to take things forward. For the youth movement, there are a lot of young people uh, in Stockholm right now uh, for the strike, of course, but also within the conference venue itself. The, the major group for children and youth within the UN has mobilized a lot of young people, brought them here. They have a youth statement that's gonna go out. But at the same time, 
there is not enough integration of what youth demands are versus what governments are going to do. And later on today, we're hoping that when the youth statement goes out, there'll be a lot of government that will raise their hand to say that, okay, we're not just going to listen to the statement, but we would work with you to implement some of these statements. So for me, the atmosphere now is that we all agree that we are fundamentally late. We need to take action. Individuals are agreeing, but the system is not demonstrating that agency. And, and that is what I see. Mm. Yeah. How about you, Maximo? I feel more or less uh, the same as the last COP. This feels like a mini COP, but non-official. Mm. So uh, the members of the state is like they're preparing for the next official staff and binding staff. But when I talk to them, I, I, I see them a little bit more relaxed, you know, like this is like a meeting. Okay, let's talk more about it. The plenary was uh, the same speeches that I've been listening since 13 years ago. Uh, I'm saying this not in, in, in a bad, bad way. It's like my humble opinion no uh, we already know that we have to act it's the the slogan of every cop of, of every uh, of this kind of events but what I like to 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 say that is very important is the 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 role of the youth that it's it's very impressive we always say this but it's important to to um, highlight that we are growing in numbers and we are trying to organize ourselves and 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 getting resources and every day we are more and more and we are already like like decide more or less where we we want to go and the atmosphere inside i totally agree with joshua we don't feel like the urgency when we are talking because in my hometown half the population is poor mm. it's not like we are we are talking totally relaxed in something that we had to do with many contradictions, of course, because of diversity. But I, I believe that we need new mechanisms and, of course, get youth more involved in those tables, in those speeches, in those plenaries, and not only youth, uh, vulnerable uh, uh, communities and indigenous people. A lot of indigenous people... Uh, didn't uh, allow to. They yeah. didn't came uh, to the to the venue, and we have to say that. Sorry, mm. yeah. but so there is. This is a, we're experiencing a crisis, and the most uh, vulnerable and most affected group are the youth people or the young people and the youth. From a youth perspective, what is demanded for these uh, people in power to actually make a difference? and make a change. I, I have a session earlier today in the, in the venue. We had a session together with the Dutch uh, Minister for Environment and uh, other decision makers with young people from around the world. And the answer to this question for many young people is that access to decision making. Every decision, whether it's COP, whether it's here, like you said, if all of them is rested on the shoulders of the ministers and they do not have any close relationship with the youth, we have our demands, they have what they want to do. In the end, the future that is being created for young people is created without them and without their input. And there's this common saying that nothing about us without us. So for me, the starting point of what demand is really needed now is how do we get power to the people? How do we get power in terms of decision making? Okay, we know that the climate crisis is here. We know biodiversity crisis is here. And ministries are updating their national determined contribution, the national adaptation plan, the ND SDGs reviews. How are young people contributing to that process to make sure that the next budget for the country in terms of addressing this ecological crisis is enough to pay attention to the needs of young people? And if that decision-making process do not include young people, everything else that we say, it doesn't fit into a mechanism because all the mechanisms are already made. The ministry has their portfolio for the next five years. It's concluded. Then they have to go and review. We don't have a chance to sit at the table. If we get a seat to the table, sometimes even the people who sit at the table are not even educated, capacitated, and not uh, give empowered enough to make a meaningful input. It ends up with a nice photograph that get posted to say that ah, the minister and this high-level person met with these young people. End of story. Mm. So how do we really translate power to young people so that we can move? One advocacy is being on the street to, to campaign, but one is also sitting down with the decision makers to really make a joint decision about what needs to be done. So for me, the starting point is trusting young people with power, and with the decision-making mandate that they can really work with institutions to co-create a better future.
Maximo, has there been any good outcomes of these past two days? Uh, I would say that, of course, we are like trying to... It sometimes it appears that we criticize everything, but, <laughs> but I believe that uh, we are moving forward in sometimes baby steps and in some places in big steps. I have to say that also because we are trying, we are trying very hard as, as human beings. The, we, we need to understand that this is a transition because we cannot do it from one day to another. We just said we are 8 billion people. 8 billion people have to change uh, habits, habits and way with different cultures. cultures. The, on, the only thing we have in common is diversity as human beings. So we need to work with that. That's why there are so many contradictions and that's why we need sometimes to see the big picture and try and try to be in this kind of events and invest in youth to be in these events because when we talk face to face with the decision makers, it's totally different the conversation and when you listen in the press or in a video. I will give a, 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 a very simple example. Uh, I talked to one a decision maker, member of state president, and he told me in my face, literally, he told me, hey, you need to understand that we really don't know exactly how to tackle climate change. You need to understand that. And with that, that honesty in my face, now I work in a different way because we act. That's our proposition. And uh, the proposition of act is make proposals. Okay, here are the ideas that actually can work to change this, to transform society in the next couple of years, not in one day. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I love yeah. the, uh, the engagement and the, like the fire, and I really think that youth can be the change, and we need the, um, the diversity to actually create a change. So is there anything you would like to say to the young people watching this right now who might feel powerless in this very urgent situation? Well, I'll say that nothing can be achieved without hope. And we've seen progress, as Maximo said. At the same time, please don't lose hope and don't lose the urgency to demand. We need to keep demanding, we need to keep asking, and we ourselves need to keep acting. So that is my message to everyone. Act, demand, and keep hope alive. Yeah. Thank you. I agree totally with Joshua. Uh, and I would say that um, please, please, Uh, investigate as youth. We need to know what is going on. We need to share in every space uh, we can. That means family, friends, in our work, in every role, in every career we are studying. And for me, from my humble opinion, is we need to start thinking in solutions, not only demands. It's like, let's go work, think together intergenerationally and say, this is the path and push, push, push and push. We cannot stop pushing because we know what is at stake. We really know what is at stake. So don't lose hope, please. Let's keep working together. We are millions right now and we will millions next year more and more and more. Mm. And one last thing, get into politics. <laughs> like really, I mean, if you want to have any chance of making those radical changes, you got to be the decision maker. So for those who have interest, those who don't have interest, we should all be interested into politics. We should become politicians and we should make the changes that we are actually asking for. Mm. Thank yeah. you both. Um, final question. Um, what's next? What do we bring to COP27? I would say that we will try to be the, the more than possible. It's in Egypt. There are some complications, uh, as usual, in every venue. Last year, we know it was impossible to get there for a lot of people. Uh, we will try to make the effort uh, and have resources to, so we say here we are. But the question and the answer for me is going to be always the same right now. Implementation and financial. Let's see uh, uh, financement. We, we have to, to see a way and, and look some way to really get to the point and start doing what we need to do and act locally. That's so important. We are always like, like a, a talking about the global crisis, but we need to see what's going on around us and start acting there. We, if we do that, 
changes, we can see changes, and that also gives us more energy to uh, grow and expand and do it regionally, etc. That's how we start, and now we are more than 500 organizations in Latin America and the Caribbean working together, doing amazing things. Mm. I think from my side, COP27 agency. We are already too late, we know that, and I want to feel that heat with everybody coming to COP that it has to be now or never. Mm. Then the second part is COP is only an event. It's two weeks of an event. You cannot really do much. The actual work is what you do at home. So before you start preparing for COP and planning all of that, please make sure that you are rooted with your constituency, with your mayors, with your local government. Get them, sit down, have a plan how you're going to implement action. And COP is a place to just demonstrate that. But really, the actual work is what you do with your community and your leadership at home. So let's invest in that and let's do more of that. And we can come to COP and learn from each other, network and go back and do the work at home. Wonderful last words. Thank you so much, Maximo and Joshua, for coming here and giving us your update and anal analysis. <laughs> Victor, back to you. Thank you so much, Clara. That was amazing. And thank you for joining us. The next Stockholm Plus 50 Climate Hub session is on Sunday. It will be a special, special session for World Environmental Day. Your host of the day will be Clara Henry again. And the session will focus on youth activism to achieve change. So see you Sunday at noon. Thank you very much.